welcome. Uh, buonasera, benvenuti a tutti. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's lecture by my colleague, Lynn Lancaster. I'm Elizabeth Rodini. I'm the Andrew High School Arts Director at the American Academy in Rome. And I have the privilege of hosting this event, which is the last of our public programs for the fall of 2020. And it's really great uh, to wind up the season with something that I know will be smart, thoughtful, and entertaining. And I know this because I have had 18 months to get to know Lynn Lancaster as a scholar, a teacher, and a friend, and to appreciate the depth of her knowledge and the intelligent energy that she brings to all of her work. Lynn is the Andrew W. Mellon Humanities Professor at the American Academy in Rome, a position she has filled for the past two and a half years. At the Academy, she has expanded her already considerable following of friends, students, mentees, colleagues, admirers, and groupies on social media with her lectures, her walks through Rome, and her infectious love of the city. As an archaeologist who specializes in the building technologies of the ancient Roman world, Lynn has spent plenty of time in Rome. Most important, of course, was her Rome Prize uh, of 2001-2002, but she also spent 2007-8 in Rome and around the Mediterranean with the support of a National Science Foundation History of Technology grant. Two books resulted from these research forays, both from Cambridge University Press, Innovative Vaulting in the Architecture of the Roman Empire from the 1st to the 4th century CE of 2015, and Concrete Vaulted Construction in Imperial Rome, Innovation in Context of 2005. And the second of these won the 2000, 2007 James R. Weissman Book Award from the Archaeological Institute of America. And the Institute also honored her in 2010 by naming her that year's Joukowsky Lecturer. Lynn's articles are numerous and have been published in, among others, the Journal of Roman Archaeology, the American Journal of Archaeology, and various edited volumes and compendia. Her work has also been featured in more popular media, in large part because she is so adept at communicating things that too many of us are intimidating. And uh, that's yet another reason she's so valuable here at the American Academy, teaching neophytes like me about how buildings work. One really important lesson I've learned from Lynn while in Rome is look up. The vaults above you are astonishing and endlessly fascinating. Lynn's comfort level with structures and technology is rooted in her unique training. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University and worked as a practicing architect for firms in Philadelphia and Blacksburg, Virginia before going back to school and receiving an MPhil and a DPhil in classical archaeology, both from Oxford University. Lynn has been a member of the faculty at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio since 1997, where she is professor in the Department of Classics and World Religions. Ever curious and adventurous, Lynn's research takes us in another direction today. In keeping with the Academy's theme of the city, she has prepared a new talk on a new topic, Rome Urbs, Urbs Pensilis, a hanging city and its hanging gardens. As you listen, please feel free to put questions in the Q&A and we will have a conversation at the end of the lecture. And now, Lynn, uh, I turn it over to you. Wow, thank you, Elizabeth. So thanks to everyone for being here. And I have to admit that the presentation I'll give today is not the one that I thought I would be giving when I proposed this title. But in the end, I had a really great time putting it together, and I hope that you will find it engaging and maybe even convincing. So Pliny the Elder, writing in the mid-first century AD, called Rome an herbs pensilis, a hanging city, hence the title of this talk. Now what does this even mean, a hanging city? It clearly has something to do with the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is what I'm going to try to unpack today. I want to examine the hold that one city had on the imagination of Greco-Roman culture and how it affected both the physical and conceptual image of another city, Rome, as it became the center of a new empire during the first century AD. So let's start by looking at this image. This was designed by Martin van Heemskerk in 1572. And first, we have a woman riding a horse in the foreground about to kill a lion. 
This is Queen Semiramis, a semi-mythical Assyrian queen who's reported to have accomplished great feats of engineering during her reign, including the founding of Babylon. Then we have the walls of Babylon, and that's the title of the talk, or of the, um, the image, as you see above. We've just gotten to the bridge over the Euphrates, which Semiramis was said to have also constructed. And then we have the Tower of Babylon uh, from the book of Genesis, which may refer to the ziggurat that is accredited to Semiramis. And then finally, we have the Hanging Gardens, which is not attributed to her, but rather is said to have been the work of a later king, and that becomes relevant. So the real Semiramis was probably a queen who lived in the 9th century BC, but Sim that the Semiramis described by the Greek and Roman authors is clearly a mythical figure. Now, this image was part of a series of engravings of wonders designed in 1572 by Van Heemskerk. And these are the canonical seven wonders that we think of today. But in ancient times, there was no consistent canon, as we'll see. So for example, in the upper right, you see the Lighthouse of Alexandria, but that didn't appear on the list until the 6th century AD. The earliest complete list of seven wonders that survives comes from an epigram of Antipater, and depending on which Antipater, the one from Sidon or from Thessalonica, it could date to either the 2nd century or the 1st century BC. So let's see what he says. I have gazed on the walls of impregnable Babylon, along which chariots may race, and on the Zeus by the banks of the Alpheus. I have seen the hanging gardens and the Colossus of Helios, the great man-made mountains of the lofty pyramids and the gigantic tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the sacred house of Artemis that towers to the clouds, the others were placed in the shade for the sun himself has never looked upon its equal outside Olympus. Now, regardless of which Antipater wrote this, it is the earliest preserved of the seven, of the list of seven, though he does not call them wonders. And also note that this list includes two different monuments from Babylon. It has both the walls and the hanging gardens. So Babylon is getting special attention here. Now, ironically, the Hanging Gardens are the only ones whose existence are not attested by either archeological remains or by contemporary authors. Now, in a 2013 book, which you see on the left, Stephanie Dolly at Oxford proposes that the gardens never existed at Babylon and were actually at Nineveh. You can see here on the right that Babylon is in the valley of the lower Euphrates, whereas Nineveh is further north at the foot of the mountains. No physical trace has ever been found for the Hanging Gardens at Babylon, but Dali has provided both written and material evidence for the existence of elevated gardens built by King Sennacherib at Nineveh around 700 BC. So you have to read her book to get the details of her argument, but I wanna give you just a taste to show that Hanging Gardens probably did exist somewhere. Between 1845 and 1847, Henry Liard, an English diplomat and traveler, excavated at Nineveh. In Sennacherib's palace, he found numerous stone relief panels, which he brought back to the British Museum and can be seen there today. One of the panels now only survives in this drawing. And when Layard first saw it, he immediately thought of the descriptions of the hanging gardens of Babylon by the ancient authors. It shows trees planted along terraces on the slopes of a hill. And then to the far right in the red box, you can just see a column structure supporting trees above. And this is what excited Layard. A hanging garden is not simply a garden on a hill. It is a garden supported on man-made structures. That's what makes it appear to be hanging. It's raised off the ground. And there are two main technological challenges in creating an artificially elevated garden. 
The first is to build a substructure capable of supporting the weight of the soil without being damaged by the roots or the moisture. And then the other is to raise the water to the height of the garden. Sennacherib also left written descriptions. And on the left, you see one of Sennacherib's prisons. He had various of these clay cuneiform prisms. And in these prisms, he actually describes his palace without rival, as he calls it, noting that he built elevated, an elevated garden that had aromatic fruit trees. And he also describes an elaborate water lifting device to supply the garden. Another panel found in the palace of Sennacherib's grandson, Ashurbanipal, also in the British Museum, shows a view of a garden on the hillside. And I'm going to bring in a colored version of this because this one's really difficult to read. Note the aqueduct coming in from the right with the pointed arches. The trees on top of the arches imply that they're above the structure and they extend to the left along the crest of the hill. And we know that Sennacherib did in fact go to great effort to bring water to his city from higher elevations around Nineveh because we saw that it's near the mountains because the remains of his aqueduct still exist along with an inscription saying that he did it. Here you see the remains of the aqueduct bridge at Jerwan, which had pointed arches, just like the relief panel shows. And I'm just going to sort of complete those there. We can assume that this relief panel was not just pure make-believe. The idea of the hanging garden clearly captured the imagination of the Hellenistic Greeks. And the history of these two cities is of some relevance to understanding their later reception. In 689, Nineveh sacked Babylon. And then in 612, Babylon and others came together to sack Nineveh. And it never really recovered its greatness after that. Under King Nebuchadnezzar, who's later credited with building the Hanging Gardens, and he's credited by Josephus, Babylon became the regional power. And he is also famous in the Old Testament for sacking Jerusalem and deporting many Jews to Babylon for what is known as the Babylon captivity. And then finally, in 539, the Persian King Cyrus the Great captured Babylon and it became a, a Persian holding and the Jews were sent back to Israel. It remained in Persian control until Alexander the Great captured it in 331 BC. Thus, after the sack of Nineveh in 612, the gardens would not have existed anymore. If there were gardens at Babylon, it's very unlikely that they would have remained after the Persian takeover in 539. So our Greco-Roman authors are probably not actually seeing any garden. Diodorus Siculus, is the earliest description we have of the Hanging Gardens. He was writing in the mid first century BC around the time of Caesar. And for his Persian materials, he cites an earlier author named Ctesias of Canidos, who was actually living in Persia in about 400 BC. Now in the midst of his discussion of the work of Semiramis at Babylon, Diodorus mentions the Hanging Gardens but he notes that they were not built by her, but rather by a later king. She doesn't name anyone. He then goes on to give a remarkably detailed description of them providing the length, the height, the materials, and even waterproofing methods to protect the structure from mo the moisture of the soil. So it's quite detailed, which is why I'm not showing it all to you now. Now, the passage by Diodorus was what developed my initial interest in the Hanging Gardens. In the mid-1990s, I was researching methods of protecting concrete vaulting from water infiltration in my dissertation. And as I was reading about the excavations of the Domus Tiberiana on the Palatine, uh, which were led by Clemens Krauss in the mid-80s, I discovered that they had uncovered evidence for waterproofing associated with hanging gardens. And this was my initial introduction into this topic. 
So here we are looking across at the Palatine at the Farnese Gardens, which are actually standing on top of the section where they excavated. So this gives a pretty good sense of how the ancient hanging gardens on the Palatine would have appeared. Now here we are looking at the same corner of the Palatine from above. And the excavations that are of particular interest occur where you see the red box over to the left. So it's right at the edge of the built out section of the Palatine. And if we bring in a plan, you can see the area excavated. And then in the next one, this is actually a plan of the substructures below. So you can see that the part that they excavated is right on top of these vaulted substructures. The excavators found that the extra dose of those vaults were covered with a raised layer of bipedales, which are basically large two foot bricks. Uh, and you see those on the left. And they were supported on suspensuri, or like little stilts of smaller bricks. And these were used to protect the concrete vaults from the humidity of the soil and also from the damage to tree roots. Conveniently, the excavators also found a post-64 AD Neronian brick stamp on one of the bipedales. So we know that this was part of Nero's Domus Aurea. Now the section on the right shows the location of these layers of bipedales in the red boxes. And note that they also found a similar type of covering at a higher level, which was part of a later phase. That's shown in the green. Now this technique of a low raised floor has often been taken to be diagnostic of the presence of a hanging garden as I did in both my dissertation and my book on concrete construction uh, from 2005. However, as I revisit this material some 25 years later, I realized that these two situations, the one in green and the one in red, are not exactly parallel. So note that the Neronian examples has these air shafts and these are critical in giving us an indication of the depth of the soil because the top you can see the tops of the air shafts and in this case it gives a depth of about two meters and so that's what would allow for the depth of the soil to support the trees and these types of raised floors have been found elsewhere on the palatine um, well, the green, which uh, you see here, but also in other places. And they've also been found on the Oppian Hill uh, at Trajan's Baths. But only these Neronian ones provide any indication of the depth of the soil on top. And I'm beginning to wonder if the raised floors might not have been limited to hanging gardens. So they might not be quite as diagnostic as, as I thought. Now here's a reconstructed section that shows the edge of the garden surrounded by a portico over to the left. And I am going to put some soil in this garden. And now I'm going to put a cypress, a lemon, and a plain tree. Now, one of the points of a hanging garden is to house trees that can be seen from afar. Flowered gardens just don't have the same visual effect. But what about the water to keep these trees alive? The Palatine was ser first served by the Aqua Marcha from the mid second century BC, and then by Agrippa's Aqua Julia. But neither one of these reached the height necessary to supply the new gardens. So here you can see earlier aqueducts only reached about 42 meters above sea level whereas the surface of the hanging garden was at about 49 meters above sea level. So it was only after Nero extended the Aqua Claudia to the Palatine that there was an aqueduct that could deliver water to the height of the new gardens. So one project was actually dependent on the other. Now, as I suggested many years ago, I do believe that Nero was intentionally trying to create a wonder in his palace. No ancient author tells us this explicitly, but we do know that he created an imitation of the Colossus of Rhodes in his own likeness, and that was uh, noted by Pliny the Elder and described. He actually saw it. 
Seneca had been Nero's tutor and advisor for much of his reign. And he wrote in one of his letters, do not men live contrary to nature who grow fruit trees on top of a wall or raise waving forest upon the roofs and battlements of their houses, the roots starting at a point to which it would be outlandish for the treetops to reach. Now Seneca wrote this towards the end of his life when he was trying to distance himself from the emperor and eventually Nero famously forced Seneca to commit suicide. Since there's only one person in Rome who really had the ability to build a forest on his roof, I suggest that this was probably a veiled comment on the emperor's gardens. And Tacitus, in talking about Nero's engineers Severus and Keller, noted that their, their real ability was, to, quote, to create a semblance of what nature had refused. But then that's exactly what made the idea of a hanging garden really special, was because it was not natural. That brings me to Pliny, the comments of Pliny the Elder, where I started this talk. Pliny wrote the natural histories in the 70s AD during the reign of Vespasian, who after Nero's own suicide and a year of civil war, is the person who took the crown. And Pliny dedicated the natural histories to his friend Titus, who is the son of Vespasian. And so there's a, definitely a political subtext through, throughout the work that promotes Vespasian and especially in opposition to Nero. Pliny introduces the idea of a hanging city in his penultimate book of the natural histories in book 36. And that's about quarried stones. So to understand what he's doing, we have to set the context. He starts and he's just describing different types of stone. He moves on to discuss uh, sculptures of white stones, including Phidias, the creator of the wonder, the statue of Zeus at Olympia, which itself was gold and ivory and not white stone, but evidently Phidias also carved white marble. And then Pliny goes on to discuss the sculptors of the mausoleum, another of the wonders. And in this list, I'm putting wonders in yellow. He then turns to colored stones and mentions a famous statue of the Nile in black Ethiopian stone, which was enormous, that Vespasian had put in his form of peace. After that, he spends 10 paragraphs on Egyptian obelisks, including their transport to Rome. And he emphasizes that getting the obelisk up the Tiber was a challenge due to their weight. But he concludes that the successful completion of the task showed that the Tiber has, quote, just as deep a channel as the Nile. So he seems to be setting up like a rivalry between the Tiber and the Nile. After that, he pivots to the pyramids, noting with disdain that, quote, they rank as a superfluous and foolish display of wealth on the part of the kings. And then he mentions the lighthouse at Alexandria, which remember had not actually made the list of seven yet, at least not in the list that have been preserved, but it's clearly impressive. And, but then he counters that by noting that Italy has its own lighthouses. It has one at Ostia and Ravenna. And again, sort of setting up this rivalry between Egypt and, and Italy. Then comes this odd little tangent on Thebes in Egypt. And at this point, I just want to give a shout out to this book by Andy Merrill's Roman Geographies of the Nile, published in 2017. I did not know what in the world to think of this passage until I stumbled on Merrill's excellent discussion of it in this book. And this is really what cut the proverbial Gordian knot for me. Um, however, I just want to say he is not responsible for anything outlandish that I may say in this following discussion. So let's look at this strange passage on Thebes. We read of a hanging garden, and more than this, a whole hanging town, Thebes in Egypt. 
the kings used to lead forth their armies in full array beneath it without being detected by any of the inhabitants. Even so, this is less remarkable than would have been the case had a river flowed through the middle of the town. If any of this had been true, Homer would certainly have mentioned it when he spoke so emphatically of the hundred gates at Thebes. And that's it. He ends. So Pliny tells us this, and then he tells us he doesn't believe any of it. Now it's generally been taken that the reference to the city with the river running through it refers to Rome, and we'll see why in a second. And then that's it. He moves on to describe another wonder, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. But then six paragraphs later, he finally gets to the heart of his message, the wonders of Rome. He says, but this is indeed the moment for us to pass on to the wonders of our own city, to show that here too in our buildings, we have vanquished the world. If we imagine the whole agglomeration of our buildings massed together and placed in one great heap, we shall see the grandeur towering above us to make us think that another world were being described, all concentrated in a single place. So all this buildup of describing wonders is to say that Rome has more wonders than the whole rest of the world can even imagine. So then he goes on to you know, describe some of these. And after describing some of these noteworthy wonders, he ends the list with the following. The substructure of the capital, and furthermore, the city sewers, the most noteworthy achievement of all, seeing that hills were tunneled under and Rome, as we mentioned a little earlier, became a hanging city. But then he continues, beneath which men traveled in boats during Marcus Aurelius's term as Edal after his consulship. So here you see the Cloaca Maxima with water in it, now, I am not absolutely convinced that these boat rides really happen, but more on that later. First, I wanna to return to that text, the phrase highlighted here, as we mentioned a little earlier. So this refers the readers back to the Thebes discussion and tells them that he did indeed mean Rome as the city with the river running through it. However, the city most famous for having a river running through the middle of it is Babylon. So Diodorus Siculus, quoting Tessius again, said she, Semiramis, drew the Euphrates into the center and built around the city a wall. Then he later says, as the Euphrates runs through the center of Babylon, and then Strabo, writing over a half a century earlier than, than Pliny, says, for the river, that's the Euphrates, a stadium in width flows through the middle of the city. So I think what Pliny has done is a bit of rhetorical gymnastics here. He set his readers up to imagine Babylon in their minds, only to substitute Rome a few paragraphs later. Now the river running through Rome would ostensibly be the Tiber, but he then turns it into the man-made river of the Cloaca Maxima. Now Strabo had emphasized the, the size of the Cloaca Maxima by noting that the sewers vaulted with close fitting stones have in some places left room enough for wagons loaded with hay to pass through them. And I just put this picture in uh, that has people in there just so you can get a sense of, of the scale and you know, a wagon could go through there. But Pliny turns Strabo's wagons into boats. And by doing so, he turns the cloaca into a river. He goes on to say, through the city, this is Pliny, through the city, there flow seven rivers meeting in one channel. These rushing downwards like mountain torrents are constrained to sweep away and remove everything in their path. And when they are thrust forward by an additional volume of rainwater, 
they batter the bottom and sides of the sewers. So the seven rivers that converge into one could reference the seven hills of Rome. But there's also an allusion to the Nile here. And the Nile was said to have had seven mouths. This is one reason I believe that Pliny wanted to use Thebes rather than Babylon itself as a point of transition to set up the Cloaca passage. He wanted to use the Nile, the greatest of the rivers. Now, the connection of Agrippa with the boats brings up images of the naval battle at Actium, which is the event that brought the Nile into the possession of Rome. And we've already seen how he set up the competition between the two rivers in getting the obelisk up to Rome. So he goes on and in emphasizing how great are the sewers of Rome, he says, sometimes the backwash of the Tiber floods the sewers and makes its way along them upstream. Then the raging floodwaters meet head on within the sewers and even so the unyielding strength of the fabric resists the strain. So Pliny has the sewers becoming the setting of a battle between the floodwaters of the Tiber and the floodwaters rushing down through the sewers, which I would suggest stand for the Nile, which is famous for its floods. But the battling waters are tamed by the cloaca and like the substructures of the Capitoline, the sewers become the very foundations that hold the city aloft and make it into a hanging city. Now, Pliny was not the first to turn the sewers into rivers. Strabo, again, had turned them into rivers by adding the water from the aqueducts. He says, and water is brought into the city through the aqueducts in such quantities that veritable rivers flow through the city and the sewers. And so Pliny ultimately ends this section of Book 36 with the aqueducts. So he says, but we must go on to describe wonders which are unsurpassed in virtue of their genuine value. And then he goes on and he talks about various aqueducts. Oops. If we consider the distances traversed by the water before it arrives, the raising of the arches, the tunneling of the mountains, and the building of level routes across deep valleys, we shall readily admit that there has never been anything more remarkable in the whole world. So I think Pliny was using the idea of the Hanging Gardens as a kind of foil in order to reinforce one of his major themes, which was the value of good, solid, utilitarian infrastructure, like sewers and aqueducts, over the fripperies of excessive luxury, like those enjoyed by Nero, and also by Antony and Cleopatra in Alexandria. This also reinforced the political theme promoted by Vespasian in response to his predecessor Nero, who he was very anxious to distance himself from. So we've seen the hanging gardens adopted in two different ways at Rome. One literal by Nero to promote his egomania by creating a wonder, and one literary to counter that with the cloaca maxima and the aqueducts. Thus the hanging gardens became a pawn during the first century AD in the battle over creating the image of the new imperial capital in the wake of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Now, the ancient world was an urban culture and cities had their own personalities. They stood as cultural symbols. I would agree with Stephanie Dolly that there probably were never any hanging gardens at Babylon, but the evidence from Nineveh suggests that such things did exist. By the time we get to the Hellenistic period, when the wonders started to be listed, Babylon held a much greater resonance than did Nineveh. For the Jews, there had been the Babylon captivity, for Alexander, it was the sim symbolic of his great conquest and it was the place of his death. That the hanging gardens were in Babylon made them all the more evocative 
because they contributed to the city's reputation as a symbol of Eastern luxury and decadence. Ultimately, for the Christians of the late first century AD, Babylon became a stand-in for Rome herself in the book of Revelations, where the whore of Babylon sits upon the seven hills, symbolizing Rome and her empire. So as they say, what goes around comes around. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, this was fascinating. I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm fascinated the way you work between the cities and how one sort of becomes a symbol for another and one replaces another and the city is this literal thing, but also a symbolic thing. Um, and I, I really love these thoughts about infrastructure versus luxury. I think, <laughs> I think a lot about that in our American cities. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> thinking about that when uh, I was writing thinking right about too. our own uh, cities as symbolic of what our values are. So I, I think um, you gave us a lot to think about. And um, we see we have some questions coming in, but I'm encouraging people to start to put some questions in the Q&A and maybe I'll, I'll throw a few out to Lynn mm -hmm. to get started. Um, sure. I guess, uh, you know, full disclosure, not a specialist in the ancient world, um, <laughs> learning much more and more every day, but if you could just, you know, is, is it, um, can you tell, more, tell me more about this thing with the Nile, you know, why the Nile and, and, and is it right. Egypt in particular uh, that is, the reason that the Nile is so, this sort of, what's this competition between Egypt yeah. and Rome that's um, going on? So in it, at one point when I was writing this, I sort of started veering down that uh, rabbit hole. And then I realized that, you know, I, I was uh, getting led astray. Um, and that's where I really learned a, a lot from Andy Merrill's book. Uh, but it, I mean, the Nile is, you know, one of the greatest rivers. It's also very mysterious because the ancient people didn't know where its source was. And that was a great um, object of conversation. Mm -hmm. And then this flood that happens every year was also sort of mysterious. It was like uncontrollable, but it was what provided um, the silty soil that allowed for the agriculture. Um, so, I mean, even before, um, say, Caesar, the Nile had a bit of a hold, but in Caesar's time, he was battling with Pompey. Pompey fled to Alexandria, um, hoping that uh, they would, um, you know, give him a place of refuge, and um, the uh, Ptolemy actually ordered uh, his soldiers to go out and meet um, Pompey and kill him. And they did. And once he was gone, Caesar was basically the, the only one standing. And then of course, Caesar had this affair with Cleopatra, a created a child. Um, and then after Caesar was murdered, um, Octavian and Antony sort of split the empire up and Antony also had an affair with Cleopatra and was sort of shacked up in, in Alexandria. And eventually what, you know, really leaves Octavian, AKA Augustus, uh, with an empire is when uh, his general Agrippa, um, defeats Anthony and Cleopatra in this naval battle. And then they run back to, Anthony and Cleopatra run back to, to Alexandria. They end up murder, uh, killing themselves. Um, and so that was a huge catalyst for Egyptomania. Um, and there, there have been a number of books. In fact, the, um, you know, the Pyramide here in Rome uh, is an Augustan tomb. And that was sort of part of Egyptomania. Um, and, but at that point, Egypt also became the main supplier of grain for Rome. And so those floods of the Nile are also what are providing the food for Rome, which is what ends up keeping the emperor in power. So there's lots of different um, aspects that would make the Nile, um, the capture of the Nile uh, at, at Actium, um, you know, resonate. Um, but also, 
you know, the Euphrates, they, that's a long ways away. They don't have as much contact with it. And the Nile is so exotic and Egypt was such a great culture. And there were the pyramids, you know, there were the yeah, pyramids absolutely. there. Absolutely, yeah. So um, I think you've answered, sorry, to, not to interrupt, but Del Upton asked if um, Pliny's readership would have uh, recognized these connections with Egypt and this competition. I think you're saying absolutely yes, this wasn't yeah. a unique Yeah, it was all over. Like if you look at the wall paintings in Pompeii, there's just um, e Egypt all over the place. It was a huge decorative scheme. So this was not just like upper class literary conceit. It, it, was, it permeated through, throughout society. Great. So there's a few questions about this idea of wonders. Um, uh, one is, uh, sorry, very philological, and I, I'm just going to mention it and not, I know it's, Lynn is really out on a limb here. It's from William Owens, who has a couple oh. of questions. Um, so, you know, maybe you and he can talk about this later, but he asks about the word wonders and sort of the phil philology of it. And, and thinking about its relationship to gazing, but also he proposes its roots. I'm sorry, I don't, Bill, Greek you know with you the be with light, but but I know. So I'm not I'm not really asking you that question <laughs> because I'm connecting it to another question, uh -huh. which is from uh, Valeria Brunori, who uh -huh. asks about um, marvels described by the ancient authors corresponding to reality. How much relationship do you think there is between things we read about in these ancient texts and ancient buildings? Do you think people possess the technology? to build the sorts of things that we see in these literary descriptions of wonders? Um, well, you know, s some of them, yes, I think they do, though some, you know, some things that Pliny describes are just sort of outlandish. Um, and so, no, I, I don't think that everything you read in literature uh, is, is, you know, what actually existed, though. I, I mean, I do think they, they did know about the quarries. Um, the descriptions of the marble, I think, are, are, and the sources of the marble are, are really accurate. So, I mean, I, I think there are, are levels um, that are, are definitely um, uh, represent reality, but, but then, you know, there are also ones like Pliny describes this labyrinth in, in um, Etruria, which is, I, I can't imagine that that really existed. So it, it sort of goes both ways. Well, an interesting sort of answer from uh, a listener, Rona Evyasov indicates that there were actually evidence of remains of hanging gardens at, and in Caesarea Maritima in the Pro procurator's palace. Um, yes. So, um, that that is really interesting because um, um, the people who were excavating there contacted me about that, and I told them, you know, about the Palatine. And I mean, at that that point, I was um, I really believed that if you found these, then it was diagnostic of of Painting Garden. And now, after you know, doing the research for this paper, I'm sort of wondering if we might not want to go back and reevaluate Caesarea just to see if there's like a possibility to have enough soil there to support it. But that was one of the reasons that I really wanted to point that out because, you know, things that I've said in the past, people are actually using. Um, <laughs> and I, I just want to say that, you know, minds change over the years. <laughs> Intelligent minds change their minds. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, well, here's another way of thinking about metaphor and the concrete. Um, Liz Phil or Till, I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing yep. her name wrong, um, asked um, if you could comment on the extension of the hanging metaphor for Rome with the high buildings and complaints about overhanging features blocking the sun. So it's a different way of thinking about hanging and building, if you'd ever made that connection? Mm, no, I, I mean, I haven't really. I mean, with, you know, Nero's fire and, and things. There's also the, the um, balconies that were supposedly for, for firefighters. Um, I mean, I, I really think this, this one hanging city thing, it, it, it wasn't a normal conception of the city. It was Pliny's rhetorical play on this idea. Um, and that, as I said, this was not the paper that I t intended to give originally. <laughs> I intended to say something um, quite different. Um, but I learned a lot uh, by, by doing this. Um, 
yeah. And so I, I think that, I, you know, I used to think of Pliny as just sort of a, a wacky old guy who collected um, specimens of, of bugs and rocks. Um, but I have a, a, a hugely um, increased admiration for his rhetorical skills now. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Brandon Green notes that Pliny describes foreign trees carried in triumph. So here, you know, again, how we connect yes. the rhetoric with the, would, and asks, would you, would the contents or character of the gardens have reinforced associations? So would the content of the gardens have reinforced these sorts of associations? Yes. And someone, as, as long as we're talking about contents and think, things concrete, and Stanton asks if there's uh, evidence that Nero actually treated the stone or cement to waterproof. Uh, um, yeah, so. so they I they did not find um, like normally you would find you would I think to find cacio pesto um, over the top, which is a, a waterproof mortar with um, crushed terracotta. Um, I don't believe in this case they found that, um, though I think in other cases there there may have have been some. Um, I mean, the, the thing that got me into it is that when Diodorus Siculus was, uh, was describing the Hanging Gardens, it said that first they put down a layer of um, bitumen uh, with reeds. And bitumen, you know, is like asphalt. Um, and Babylon uh, is hugely famous for uh, having supplies of bitumen. But then he says, then they put fire bricks over it, and then they put sheets of lead down oh, to, to protect it. And I did do some, some research. There's just no way they had sheets of lead in Babylon or Nineveh. I mean, lead existed, but the, not, the amount of lead in sheets that it would take. However, it, that was a technique that was used by the Romans and um, the ship at Nemi. Um, actually, I, I threw in some. Ah, yeah. So the ship at Nemi um, actually had a waterproofing that's remarkably similar to what Dio, uh, Diodorus Siculus described for the, the hanging gardens. Interesting. Um, uh, this probably, well, Carlo Vigevano, one of our advisors, uh, hello, Carlo in architecture, asks about if there's any way this could have been a sort of filtration system for water intended in the gardens. Do you think for um, yeah, you mean whether, whether uh, instead of protecting that it, it, you know. To purify the water, a sort of green oh, system. No, I don't, I don't think it would have been for that. It, um, I think one, one thing that was probably um, critical was uh, a protection from roots because roots really love lime. Like if you see, you know, if you see trees growing into walls, like, I mean, our walls here at the American Academy, um, and so roots really love to bury into lime. So I'm, I'm guessing that part of the reason of those floors was to keep the roots from, you know, burying down into vaults, which they eventually did. Yeah. Um, and they had a lot of, a lot of like trouble we see in the restoring sidewalks them. all over Rome. The yeah. Exactly. Of the trees. <laughs> well, there's two kind of questions that are, are, are different, but deal with the trees in a different way. And so mm -hmm. I want to ask them to you. One, David Friedman asks, and this is really getting into literature, which I know is, um, you know, you're, you're not my, going out not, filling your specialty, okay. but that you speak of the elevated gardens as wonderful because unnatural. Do you, ancient authors see gardens in general as unnatural, that is artificial? And then I just want to also, someone, and Natsumi Nonaka asks, the idea of the trees being visible from afar do you have any thoughts on that vis-a-vis -vis towers and buildings being seen from um, afar? So really kind of what's the metaphor of the city vis-a-vis -vis the natural here? Yeah, so the, the being visible from afar, um, I would like to footnote Kathy Gleason on, on that one, um, who is a garden expert. Um, and I mean, she, at a conference we had here at the American Academy, she really emphasized um, the visual aspects, not, not just of hanging gardens, but of, of um, like villa gardens, because it was a, a way of you know, showing off. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it, it's meant to be unnatural. I think the unnatural part is the roots being at the level of, of the roofs. Mm -hmm. And 
Seneca was also, I mean, that was part, uh, he was making um, a point about stoicism. Um, and that, that passage came in a whole list of things that were against nature. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And uh, so it, it, was, it was part of a, a larger uh, discourse on stoicism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned um, Kathy Gleason, and she actually has a comment here just saying that soil depths, actually a half a meter or less of garden soil is typical. So wow. we could have, so I'll let you all talk about that. Okay. <laughs> off camera. That, no, that's really useful because I had no idea how much soil it takes. So, I mean, there is something that, that Diodorus and Strabo both emphasize is that, um, there needs to be a sufficient depth, um, but and they're using that to emphasize the size of the trees mm -hmm. um, that would mm -hmm. have been in the hanging garden. Well, here's a question that's maybe more uh, directly up your usual alley. And this is from Rosanna Hall asking if she, there's any evidence from gardens, other ancient gardens, of raising water in cups or screws from lower water sources, such as used in Nineveh. Um, yeah, so the, the screws in Nineveh, um, that comes from a late source, Philo of Byzantium, and uh, Stephanie Dolly has a, a whole uh, chapter on, on that, um, and there's, you know, great debate on, on whether or not those existed at Nineveh or not. Um, I mean, the screws that I know of uh, have been found in, in mines, actually, for, for getting the water out of mines. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's a, a famous, um, painting in the house of the Thebes that has like a little, a little guy, it's a Nile scene. Um, and it's got a little guy on a, on a water wheel that's sort of, uh, drawing water up. Um, so I, I mean, I, I don't know of any examples that can be directly linked to, to gardens, but I mean, it was a known technology and then the water cups, um, yeah, that those two I tend to associate with with mines or wells or bilges on ships, um, but I don't know of any write off that are associated with with gardens. But um, there could be. Well, I, I'm actually going to pose uh, just one more question, and but Lynn, I'm going to encourage you to look at all the questions. A lot of them are <laughs> okay, I think you'll find interesting, and maybe Lynn can get back to people individually. Um, but another from Valerio Brunori that I'm actually interested in too is aside from um, Pliny, Vitruvius, and Varro, which in your opinion are other important sources uh, regarding Roman architecture, r written sources? Besides Pliny, Varro, and Vitruvius, are there any impor other important sources that you... Well, there's the late sources. I mean, there's Palladius and, and um, uh, Faventinus, uh, who are, are both, you know, like third and fifth century, I think. But they're, um, they're playing off uh, Vitruvius. I mean, they're using Vitruvius as a source. I mean, you know, people like Philo of Byzantium, I mean, he's a Greek... Uh, a Greek writer, uh, but he's talking about, um, you know, arm armaments and, and walls and things. And I think he's, he's can be very useful. Um, this play between, you know, what to trust and what to, how, where to put your, yeah. your faith in the well, you know, I, I am an archaeologist at heart. And so I'm usually pretty skeptical about, um, you know, what we read in the literature, especially the more I dive into the subtext of the literature, because often they're using architecture and even construction for alternative purposes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's um, actually a really nice way to wind up. It's really architecture. I mean, you're playing really nicely between architecture as metaphor and mm. what can, we can find in the archaeological record. And that seems like a really challenging balance to strike. But I can tell by the number of questions that we still weren't able to answer that you've, you've interested a lot of people. I will tell you, those of you whose questions we didn't address, I, we can save these questions. So, you know, if you want to 
I'm going to offer Lynn services yeah, to I will answer as many as she at, can. At all the questions, um, but you, anybody is welcome to, uh, you know, write me at l.lancaster at aar.org and uh, I would love to hear not just your questions, but your, your comments and your ideas. Yes, it's clear that you're, you've um, connected with lots of people's interests in, in, in across the spectrum. So um, thank you, Lynn. Thanks to you. Thank you to everyone who attended this talk. As I mentioned, this is our last public event of this fall season, but we will be back in the new year, including with our weekly Monday Night Fellow Shop Talks beginning in late January um, in what we hope will be a happier, healthier year for everyone. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks again. Thanks everyone.